Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and you're listening to Human Potential at Work. As a reminder, I'm the CEO of Rue Global Impact, and we're very devoted to social activism, making sure the world works for everybody with a um, definitely emphasis on making sure that people with disabilities and people that are um, aging, like all of us are, are also being fully included. Of course, we're still doing the show during COVID-19, and um, our guest is very relevant to that topic as, since he is a doctor. His name is uh, Dr. Greg Hammer. He's a pediatric intensive care physician, a pediatric um, anesthesiologist, a professor at Stanford University Medical Center, and he's also um, a best-selling author. He has a new book out called Gain Without Pain, The Happiness Handbook for Healthcare Professionals, and it just came out in May 2020. So he he talks a lot about you know keeping ourselves healthy, um, mentally healthy uh, during all of the time, but certainly during this pandemic, it's very important that we do this. And I, I um, first of all, I want to welcome you to the show, Dr. Hammer. But I was also hoping that you wouldn't it, you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit more on you know your work and why you're in this work. I mean, I think it's wonderful that you're, you know, a pediatrician, but you've really taken it into a much larger conversation that is really critical right now during um, so many people struggling during the pandemic. So um, welcome to the program. I also will just, you're on mute, uh, Dr. Hammer. So um, make sure you take yourself off mute before you begin. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. A little bit yes. more about myself uh, to, to respond to your question. Uh, I've had really a lifelong fitness commitment. Uh, I've, I'm, my undergraduate degree was in nutritional science. So I've always been very interested in nutrition and also fitness. Uh, I played competitive sports uh, all throughout my youth and uh, college and uh, until recently when I had back surgery, although I'm doing great and I'm looking forward to getting back to the sports that I love. And I've been a long time meditator, <clears throat> excuse me. About 10 years ago, I, I had sort of an epiphany. I'd always been looking for something and I began to realize about a decade ago that actually there's nothing to look for other than just to be and that that which we seek is within. And, uh, I've also had a spiritual teacher named Rupert, Rupert Spira. He teaches non-duality or Advaita, and I go on retreat with him a couple of times a year. So that all sort of led to an interest I had in physician wellness because burnout in medicine is a huge problem. Uh, more than once a day, a physician commits suicide, uh, but there are much more costs of, uh, of burnout in medicine, medical errors, uh, physicians leaving their practice, etc. <clears throat> so I joined our Stanford WellMD program and uh, began to be asked to give talks on physician wellness and burnout. And so that sort of took a life of its own on. And so I've been doing that quite a bit up until the pandemic. And uh, I had some sabbatical time. I have a research lab here on, on the medical center campus and I couldn't really leave. So i asked myself what would be the most productive way to spend that six month period. And just all the arrows were pointing in the direction of helping spread the message by writing a book. And so that's what I did. And that's got me lots of interviews with lovely people like you. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Well, such an important topic. And I, I think the topic is even more relevant um, coming from your perspective. You know, we we know one of the things that we're trying to do all over the world is flatten the curve so we do not overwhelm our medical professions and our medical services. And sometimes we've been successful with that and sometimes we haven't been. And, and it's chilling to hear you uh, say something like you know, every day, you know, commit suicide. I, I, I just think that's very sad 
you know, sad during these times. So um, when you talk about burnout, what constitutes burnout? And, and I, I certainly have some opinions of my own, but um, why do you think it, it has risen during a time when we're all, uh, we've all been sent home to stay safe? Good question. I would define burnout as mental and physical exhaustion related to stress. The stressors can be internal, just related to our, our genetic and otherwise our makeup, or the stresses can be external or both. And uh, burnout is a problem that sort of is self-sustaining. That is, people who are feeling mentally and physically exhausted because of stress have poor sleep, so they're exhausted, so they tend to exercise less, they tend to eat less well because those fatty comfort foods or those processed sugary foods kind of give them a bit of a boost and make us feel uh, temporarily a little bit better. So again, this is kind of a self-propagating cycle and, and people can sort of descend in this area of, of exhaustion and burnout. Uh, certainly, this is a very stressful time for all of us. Um, none of us have experienced anything like this before. Uh, certainly in medicine and, and just in general. I mean, this is a unique, hopefully once in a lifetime event that uh, our kids and their kids who are perhaps older than three or four years of age right now will remember for the rest of their lives. Uh, we are stuck at home. Uh, many of us uh, were disconnected from a lot of those things that normally bring us pleasure and help us feel connected. Um, you know, we have a negativity bias in general, separate from the pandemic, and we tend to remember and hold on to negative things and let the positive things go. And so we focus on things we don't have instead of things that we have. And that contributes greatly to stress and burnout. And I think, uh, you know, this is a time of global suffering. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. When will this end? When will we be able to uh, see our loved ones again, uh, visit our parent in a nursing home, et cetera? And uncertainty itself breeds stress. So that would be, you know, certainly an external and very significant stressor. And uh, again, that's why I think a lot of us are feeling burnt out right now. I agree. And, and then on top of it, we have the isolation and the isolation certainly for um, I know that's something that uh, the community of people with disabilities, especially people with the more severe disabilities, um, have struggled with. And certainly that's something that we've, um, our senior citizens are struggling with. Um, there was a, I have a sad story of a friend of mine whose mother was in a nursing home and they were, you know, nobody was allowed to visit. It was locked down to keep her safe, but she wasn't really good with the technology and they, they kept trying to communicate with her and the staff was trying to help. And, and finally, the woman just, she really just gave up. She stopped eating. She stopped drinking. She refused to try to do the technology and she just died. And it was all because of isolation and loneliness. And mm. it's, I, I think um, we're seeing that compounded. I know many members of my community have struggled with that for a long time, but now you're seeing, you know, this, it just is mul the multiplying factor. And I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the isolation factor. Yes. Well, we, you know, we all feel isolated uh, to one extent or another. I've been, uh, uh, I had uh, back operation uh, seven weeks ago. And so I've been home and uh, I have had occasionally a friend over, we socially distance and sit outside, but many people don't have the luxury that I do where I have a nice yard and a lovely place to sit. People who live in apartments um, really may have nowhere to go and they may or may not have the technology to be virtually connected with people that they love. And in addition to that, I think we do have to acknowledge, as you suggested, the differential effect uh, of the pandemic on various segments of the population. I think those who are uh, at the lower socioeconomic strata uh, are suffering more, both by having a higher incidence of COVID, uh, they tend to have more health problems, they're more severely affected if they do get infected with the coronavirus. And uh, the elderly, um, I'm not sure what age that is anymore, it's getting, uh, pushing that number back further and further, but you know, 
it's interesting. I just, as an analogy, I had surgery and it was a fairly significant operation. I had all of my lumbar vertebrae fused with wow. rods and screws. And, you know, I'm, I consider myself relatively young and certainly very physically fit. And yet uh, I'm still uh, getting very sleepy in the afternoons and often have to lie down and take a nap. And that's just not me. It's almost two months out, the effect of having a major traumatic procedure. And as we get older, we just don't have the uh, ability to recover from traumatic events, whether they're physical events, emotional events, or what have you. And so the story that you told about that individual who just sort of gave up and, and, and ended up letting go of life, essentially, that's not an uncommon story. And I think for older people, they're not as resilient inherently. And so a jolt to their system, whether it's an operation for a hip replacement or it's the sudden cutoff from their loved ones is something from which they may not recover at all. And I think we all have to appreciate the differential effect that this pandemic and all of its manifestations is having on our population. I agree. And, and I also wanted, I want to dig a little bit into something else you said, because I'm with you. I don't even know what it means to be a senior citizen. Now I'm 61, gray hair, with lots of pretty purple in it. But so I really want to own my age, but it, it, it almost feels that um, society should think a little differently about aging. Uh, I definitely think society should, but you know, there are people that are in the, they're in their 100s that are healthy, they're exercising, they're engaged, and there are people that, you know, are much, much younger that are really struggling with the health and the, the you know, all the different things that you were talking about. And so I, I think at some point, society needs to really rethink, are we old because we are 65? Or is it 75? Or is it 85? Or is it, is it our mindset? And, and as you know, a, a lot of our medical professional, the doctors and stuff, a lot of them are older. We still have 70 million baby boomers uh, in the United States. And so I, I was just, you made me think about that uh, um, as you were talking. And um, I was just wondering if you wouldn't want to comment on that. Well, let's hope that old age does not begin at 65. Uh, I think you and I can agree on that. You know, the, the older we get, uh, if you look at a population, I think the older the population, the more variability there is with respect to physical and mental health. And, uh, you know, one of my heroes is a, a California artist by the name of Wayne Tebow, who's quite famous. He just turned 100. I had the opportunity to... Uh, share a meal with him and then separately get together with him on another occasion at a party. And the man is just totally with it, you know, physically fit enough to play tennis and he's still painting and his paintings are, are wonderful and well-recognized. And, um, you know, so yes, we've all seen that kind of variability. And I think uh, what we can do to stay young is not that complicated, but uh, as you suggested, a lot of people sort of give up because it does take discipline to continue to eat well, to continue to get regular exercise, which has to be modified to some extent as we get older so that we don't get injured and we're safe. And nutrition is hugely important. And so these things take uh, intention. Uh, intention uh, is part of my acronym of GAIN, which is the title of the book. And the G-A-I-N stands for gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. And those four interrelated elements, I think, are the pillars of resilience and happiness. The intention part of it includes that we have to be very purposeful about the way we live. And so sleep, exercise, and nutrition are very important. And then, as you suggested, you know, the mental game is also very important. My own mother uh, used to read, you know, fairly avidly. Uh, she used to do crossword puzzles every morning. Um, if I was staying with her, uh, whoever got up first got the crossword puzzle, but I, I usually yielded it to her. Uh, she did a lot of things that kept her mind young and active. And then her husband passed away, and then she just gradually started phasing out those things. She was also a painter, and then she stopped painting, and then she stopped doing crosswords, and then she stopped reading. And 
you know, I could see her fairly rapid decline after that. And so we have to really keep ourselves young so that the number next to our name in the box that says age becomes less important. Um, and I think that we can keep ourselves youthful and fit well into our 80s and 90s if we're, if we're intentional about it. Oh, well said. And I love, I love the um, gain in your book. And, and I loved that you started with gratitude because every time I start to get, and I struggle like many human beings with depression and stuff. And every time I start getting just really freaked out or scared or overwhelmed or depressed, my go-to solution is gratitude. Okay, what do you, and, and I think sometimes it's also, it's almost a little obnoxious, but I'm, I can find the, the most amazing uh, silver linings and the most tragic. For example, right now, my, um, my husband sustained a traumatic brain injury when he was a child, when he was hit by a drunk driver. And sadly, he's 68 and as he's aged, he's aged into dementia and he's in the very late stages. It's, it's really frightening. Yesterday, um, he forgot how to use uh, utensils. And so I was feeding him his dinner. And I think it's just this intensity of the situation is making it more, a little bit worse. So it, it changes day to day. But I think that that's why I thought that your work is so important in the book. It was so important. And, <clears throat> you know, we talked about the impact on remote workers, um, but also what about on their families? Yes, exactly. Well, I think that the elements of gain are really um, crucial for us to be resilient and find happiness because our true nature, I believe, is happiness. And it gets veiled by uh, aspects of our lives as we develop and, and the ways we are more and more wired to think. And, and a couple of truths about the way we're wired. One is that we have a negativity bias. We you know, I mentioned that we tend to remember the negative and hang on to the negative. And the other important thing is that we tend to dwell in the past and the future. And I would consider those thoughts of being other than completely present, adaptive or maladaptive. So for example, when considering our obsession with the past, we, we do have to learn from our mistakes. And that means going back to our past. We, uh, can savor the memories that we've had with our loved ones and wonderful occasions. And so that involves the past. Beyond that, really dwelling on the past is mostly maladaptive. And that's where shame and regret and embarrassment and we wish we could have done something differently comes in. And, and when we dwell on those things, those negativity elements, uh, we become unhappy and depressed. And the same thing goes for the future. You know, it's adaptive to look forward to good times with our loved ones. And we do have to plan to put food on the table. So those are adaptive considerations of the future, but we often dwell much beyond that. And we generate fear and anxiety. We catastrophize, we think of the worst thing that might happen. And while that may be a, a, a adaptive in my line of work and in, in critical care and in anesthesiology, um, it's generally not adaptive to catastrophize. And so we have to have ways that we can bring ourselves back into the present moment. And, and that's what mindfulness is all about. And really my method of the gain method, if you will, is, is how to be mindful, but I wanna give the reader and the listener specific tools. And so when we're stuck in the past, we can gradually learn to recognize that our thoughts are maladaptive. And instead of thinking of what we don't have, we have the ability through intention to think about what we do have. And, you know, we can start with uh, gratitude, as you suggested. When we're depressed about the pandemic, let's remember what things were like a little over 100 years ago in 1918 with the great influenza pandemic. 50 million people, give or take, passed away during that pandemic. And you know, the access to medical care was minimal. We obviously had no internet, so people were truly disconnected from others. Uh, sanitation was poor. Living conditions just in general were so much worse than they are now. So as bad as it is now, um, and certainly it's worse for some people than others, but 
we should be grateful that we have a lot of the benefits of our contemporary society. So no matter how bad things seem, there's always room for gratitude. Well, I, that's what I found. And, and I've also, I've been a spiritual seeker since I was a little girl. My, my mother struggled with uh, a mental illness, uh, borderline personality disorder. And so as a little kid, I, I started a spiritual practice. I remember being really little and uh, we would walk down the road and I would try to see how many people would smile back at me because my mom was always so sad. I didn't know how to fix that. So, uh, but now, so I've been doing this for a long time and I find it has been invaluable. Like you said, staying in the moment. I have a daughter with Down syndrome and one thing she taught me, she's always in the moment. She's always in the moment. It, it's fascinating because what you get with her is she's going to tell you exactly what she's feeling, who she is every moment of the day. And it's at times I find it, it, it irritating. It's like, you know, don't tell me that you're in a bad mood, it, you know, but it, she definitely lives in the moment. So being between both of them, they, they wound up being great teachers to me. But I, I would say this, and, and then I want to explore just a little bit of more of your book, because I think your book is something that we all need right now. And anybody struggling out there right now, buy the book. And remember, please give them a review. It's very important to do reviews um, when you're selling books. That's how they get ranked. That's how people find them. So I would like to ask you to please consider doing a positive review. If you want to do a negative review, uh, you can skip it. But, <laughs> but it, you know what? I, I think sometimes people think this is all woo-woo and it's all, you know, oh, it's spiritual and mindfulness. Um, but I've lived this way for so long, uh, so long. Um, and I, I just wonder if you would address a little bit when people, and, and I, um, I believe this is often, men are a little um, bit more naysayers about this kind of stuff than women from everything that I've read and the studies I've looked at. But uh, people seem to sometimes think this is just, um, well, and I'll give you one comment. My mother's struggling, poor thing, she struggled her whole life, but she told me that I was two-faced because I was so optimistic and I would only speak, I, I tried for a while, a long time, I would only talk about good stuff, which by the way, I think there's a danger in that, you know, you have to be willing to really live your entire life. But what do you say to that, Dr. Hammer, if people think, oh, it can't be, it can't be that easy that I just have to stop. And I have to think, uh, I feel so afraid. So what could I be grateful for that would make me less afraid or things like that? But I think a lot of people don't really believe these things work. Well, clearly there's a huge mind-body connection and uh, our minds are capable of going off in very negative direction. In fact, that's what they tend to do. And, uh, you know, we can take some responsibility for that by being purposeful with respect to our thought processes. And it's something that we have to learn because as we develop, we have our brains wired in such a way that we acquire this negativity bias. And you know, we have trouble with thoughts of the past and the future and, and, and are less and less present. A newborn baby, like your daughter, is completely present, presumably. I mean, we don't know what they're thinking, but in all likelihood, they're not worrying about being in the womb 20 minutes earlier or where they're going to get their next meal. They seem to be present and fully responsive to everything happening in the moment. And we can go back to that sort of beginner's mind or even newborn's mind if we choose to put in the work, but we have to develop the ability to do that. But it's not really that difficult. And that's why uh, my gain meditation can be as little as three minutes. It's just the idea that we take small steps, but we repeat it every day. And then maybe make a commitment to practice one element at least once during the day. So we started with gratitude. And to answer your question about something you may have been referring to that some call spiritual bypass. That is that they just pretend everything is, is rosy and therefore it becomes rosy, you know, that, that may be efficacious to a limited degree, but the next letter in the GAIN acronym is acceptance. And what acceptance means is that we have to acknowledge that there is a lot of pain and suffering in the world. I, I think that there's a certain resonance 
in the background of pain and suffering from hundreds of years ago. I think we still can feel the, the pain and suffering generated by uprooting our brothers and sisters in Africa, enslaving them, you know, shipping them over here under horrendous conditions and selling them and, and subjecting them further to awful conditions. And, you know, there, what we've done to each other in wars and, uh, you know, Nazi Germany during the Second World War, uh, you know, you could go on and on. And then we, we not only are affected by the sort of global pain and suffering, but our own personal pain and suffering. And the in gain being acceptance means we open our hearts to pain and suffering and we let it in. So we don't try not to think about it. Uh, there's a formula in my book, which is, and you know, we in medicine love formulas, suffering equals pain times resistance. So you may have a pain, but if you try not to think about it, if you resist it, all you're doing is magnifying the suffering. Suffering is the product of pain and resistance. The pain may not be modifiable per se, but we can modify the suffering and we can accept and reduce the suffering. And so during my gain meditation, I actually visualize my chest opening, my heart opening, and the pain and suffering in the world and in my life coming in closer and closer until we're merged. And, um, you know, that's something that I practice every morning. And so we have to be grateful because you cannot be happy unless you're grateful. You can be blind and happy. You can have trisomy 21 and be perfectly happy, but you can't be ungrateful and happy. So gratitude is key. Acceptance is key. Intention we talked about is important because we have this negativity bias. And if we're purposeful about it, using our intention, we can actually rewire our brain. And a great example of that is a program that I think is still ongoing at Duke University called Three Good Things. And basically, all you do is commit to thinking of and perhaps writing down three good things that happen during your day as you prepare to go to sleep. And what they found with tens of thousands of uh, participants in this study is that people sleep better and they become happier. So that's a good example of using our intention to rewire, to reroute our negative end of the day thinking to at least some positive thinking. So tonight I'm sure I'll think back and what a beautiful day it is here in Northern California. Although we could use some of the rain that you're getting there in Virginia. I will think of our lovely conversation for sure is a good thing before I go to sleep tonight. And then, you know, I hope to go for a bike ride and have a workout and, I'm sure I'll, I'll be happy for that tonight. And, and who knows what else may transpire today. The possibilities are endless. But um, the three good things thing is such a great example of using intention to change or rewire the way we think, um, recognizing what we have instead of what we don't have. And so when I find myself getting a little depressed, I quickly remind myself what I have you know, the miracle of life and this day and the people I love and people I think love me. And so again, we can rewire our brains through intention and that's the I and gain. And so what's the end? The end is non-judgment. And, you know, again, the way our brains are wired and, and they weren't like this when we were toddlers and, and infants, certainly, but we develop this habit of comparing one thing to another and labeling everything as good or bad, you know, better or worse. So, and because of our negativity bias, we often compare ourselves to others unfavorably. That person is better looking, taller, smarter, more athletic than I am, et cetera. But we also sometimes depersonalize during these comparisons and we we see somebody who's in an unfortunate situation and we say, well, they got what they deserved or they smoked cigarettes or some other thing and we're judging them. And we don't recognize it, but this really kind of wears us down, this constant judging. And so the end and gain being non-judgment means we learn to view the world exactly as it is. We didn't create it. We're not gonna substantially change it. So let's just look at it with sort of what Francis Lucille called a benevolent indifference. And that's not 
uh, you know, indifference does not mean being cavalier or jaded. It simply means let's not jump into judging everything as good or bad. Let's, with a smile, embrace the world, other people, ourselves, most importantly, exactly as they are and we are. And I think that's the fourth pillar of resilience and happiness. And uh, they fit together nicely in a, in a word called game because we wanna be moving forward. We don't wanna be, as you, as you discussed with aging, you know, getting older doesn't mean that we have to just sort of fade away. We can actually continue to learn and grow. Right, and, and participate and give back. And it, you were, I was thinking about my husband as you were talking because um, I certainly had to go through, uh, and, and sometimes I still do, all the different um, grief levels. And um, one thing that is, there, when I put on my clinical hat and think about what's happening, which I, which I do sometimes just because it's just too overwhelming. My husband's leaving me. You know, it, it just freaks you out sometimes because it's a really difficult walk. But he's happy. My husband is happy. So he might struggle with figuring out the fork from the spoon versus the knife or anything like that, um, or not being able to get dressed, but he's happy. He knows me. It, he is 100% in the moment now. It, it's just, it's fascinating to me in a way, the gifts that come with dementia. Would I choose this walk? No, maybe I did, but I didn't know I was going <laughs> to. If somebody asked me today, I wouldn't want my husband to have, de de you know, dementia, but it's just our walk. And I um, try to honor his soul. His soul has um, made a decision and I'm, you know, love to be, I love this soul. So we're just walking it together. But I, I wanted to, you, maybe you could just talk a little bit more about the negativity bias because we have negativity bias because it protected us as human beings. It was, yes. there was a reason why, you know, we were given negativity bias, but bias, but now it, it seems to really get in the way often of us, of us living uh, happy lives. Exactly. Well, you know, uh, as you were speaking, I was remembering that our true nature is happiness. And I saw this in my grandmother and to some extent in my mother as they developed uh, dementia at an older age. And what happens is that our true nature being happiness uh, tends to become veiled through experience and the way we're raised and, and the society in which we live, especially in the West. And that veiling can be reversed. And I think that some people with dementia, some of the time, perhaps even most of the time, demonstrate that. The, the true nature of happiness, having been veiled, is gradually being unveiled. That is, as some of the brain function that is making us constantly judge and, and catastrophize and dwell in the past and, and make ourselves miserable is, is dissipating. And I think you probably see that in your daughter as well. She probably has not undergone this veiling of her true nature of happiness to the extent that, that many others have. Right. Um, you mentioned the negativity bias. Yes, it's a teleologically explainable phenomenon because, you know, as early Homo sapiens and even before Homo sapiens, you know, we were, let's say, cave dwellers and there might have been a saber-toothed tiger just outside of the cave. And so we had to constantly be on threat alert and we had to be thinking of what's the worst thing that can happen. And so that kind of puts us on edge. That creates a certain anxiety that may at one point have been uh, favorable for our survival, but we're no longer in constant peril. We don't have to worry about where our next meal is coming from for the most part, most of us, most of the time. We don't have to worry about uh, a roadside bomb, you know, being uh, run over by our car as we leave our house. So the conditions have changed, but our conditioning has not changed along with the circumstances in which we live. But we can, we can take responsibility for that and, and change the way we think and the way we interact with the world. 
and we can ourselves unveil the covering up of our true nature of happiness. We have to just recognize it's just like developing a muscle or a set of muscles in our body. It takes conditioning, it takes work. And uh, I would suggest, and I think in my book, the message is it's easy. And so I have a three minute gain meditation that I describe in detail and I start every morning that way. And that's only three minutes. Everybody can set their alarm three minutes earlier the night before and set their intention for the following morning. So do your three good things. And when you're setting your alarm, set it three minutes earlier than you might otherwise. If you were gonna get up at 6.30, you can get up at 6.27. I don't think any of us are gonna suffer from a sleep deficit because of that three minute change. And then when you're done with your morning hygiene or whatever you do, find a comfortable place to sit. And I'll go into, I go into detail in the book, but you just simply get in touch with our breath, which is central to many kinds of meditation. And then you go through a con contemplation of these elements of gain, gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment, and then maybe pledge to be non-judgmental non today of the first person you see who might otherwise be annoying. So you're in your car driving to work, if you're ever going to drive to work again, and somebody ahead of you uh, changes lanes without using their turn signal, and maybe they cut it a little close, and you, you start to get annoyed, but you quickly remember that today you pledge to be non-judgmental of that first person you interacted with in this way. And then it actually feels good to let go of the judgment. And so baby steps, you'll get lots of positive reinforcement. And you can look back after three or six months of this practice and say, you know what, I've come a long way. I'm a lot happier than I was six months ago. Yeah, we can do it. I agree. And it's something that even though I've been on the spiritual path for so many years, uh, during this pandemic, I've gone into an even deeper, deeper dive in my spiritual practice. I, I have always been a meditator. I, um, I, I follow a lot of teachers. It has been interesting to me in a way, though, some of the teachers that I followed before the pandemic they're not, their messages is speaking to me in the same way. And I'm actually following a lot of newer teachers. I find that fascinating, including your work. And one thing that I like about your book is, what if I haven't been doing this for 40, 50 years, and I don't even know where to begin. I like that you have the step-by-step -step things. Like once again, I don't even want to hear you can't meditate for three minutes. It's ridiculous. Of course you can. We all can. And, and we have to take the time to really go inside and value who we are. But, you know, we're, you know, we're working from home. We're, we have kids running through. We have dogs. We have, we're caring for, you know, our, uh, our spouses, our, you know, all our family members. You know, uh, there's so much disruption happening right now. And, and then on top of it, you know, we're terrified because one of my sisters told my other sister that, oh, COVID-19 is a fake and, um, you know, more people have died of the flu than COVID-19. And I said to my sister, um, well, according to the CDC, but at the same time, there's just so much information. There's so misinformation. There's so much fake news. There's so much, there's so many things to be terrified about. Um, and that, you know, I can't personally just go to sleep and wait for this thing to get over with. I mean, we have to live and participate during these times. And I, I have, um, I have become a lot braver during this time talking about topics that I normally would not talk about. And I know some of my audience are like, why are you going on? Why are you talking so much about, you know, the China and the US trade relations, for example, and I'm not going to get into it in here, but I think we have to be brave during these times too, and start saying, I don't want my government picking on other governments and I don't want other governments doing that and do let's really rethink what it means to have a better society where more of us can be included but first of all we have to start with ourselves and I think that's what your book does and so if you don't mind um, I want to give you a minute to talk to sort of sum up you know what people can learn from your book and then also make sure that people know about your website and where to find you on social media 
And then once again, I want to make sure that people know how to get the book. We will provide, Dr. Hammer, if you could provide me um, these links, I will make sure that it goes with the post that we do for Dr. Hammer so everyone can go and buy the book. It's very easy to read, very great practical information, regardless of whether you're a long time um, searcher or you just began. I think we can all learn from it. And um, I think it's wonderful to support each other's work as well. So, so Dr. Hammer, give us sort of a, um, tell, tell us more about the book. Well, the book is just about happiness. Um, it starts out with, you know, why don't we have more of it? And I think many of us feel we don't deserve to be happy. You know, why don't, when we have an interaction that feels good, why don't we move toward that and incorporate more of that in our lives when we're non-judgmental? It feels good, actually, compared to being judge, judging. So why don't we just become that way more since we got this positive feedback, maybe a little hit of dopamine? And, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of that is that we are dwelling on the negative uh, and we don't feel worthy of happiness. So, yes, I think the book uh, is, would be wonderful for anybody. They don't have to be in healthcare. Uh, I hope to come out with a pocket book called Gain Without Pain, Your Happiness Handbook soon. But in the meantime, people can find uh, lots of media and information about my book at greghammermd.com. That's all lowercase, G-R-E-G-H-A-M-M-E-R-M-D.com. There is a link to Amazon where the book can be purchased. You can also go to Amazon, of course, and put Gain Without Pain and Greg Hammer in the search box and you'll find the book. And um, I appreciate what you said about reviews. Yeah, for those authors out there, yes. I mean, I've, I know that probably uh, thousands of people have read the book already, even though it's fairly new. The sales have been good, but there's only uh, 13 or 14 reviews. So yes, we all always appreciate a favorable review. Yeah, I'm an author. I have three books. And so I'm always reminding everybody those reviews make such a big difference is how, uh, for example, a bookseller like Amazon decides to rank you. So we want people to find information like Dr. Hammer's doing because people need to, to be happy and to feel like they got this during these really tough times. And, and the pandemic's not going to end tomorrow. The pandemic's not going to end probably in 2020. It's going to go on for a while. You know, we might be, you know, we've already seen this happen. We, you know, I know I live in Virginia and we're at stage three of opening back up, but other states have had to, you know, pull back. And so, we're gonna go through this a lot longer. And so I think this is an opportunity for us all to evolve and to really, um, really rethink, you know, who, who did you wanna be when you were a kid? You know, who are you? Who, what do you want the world? That's what I've spent a lot of time doing, Dr. Hammer, is thinking, what do I want the world to look like? Is it okay to me for some of the things, like for example, some of our leaders in the United States are doing to other countries? Should I just be quiet and sit back, let somebody else solve it? Or do we have an obligation to step up and really try to make the world the kind of world that works for more people? And I think you and I obviously feel that, uh, you know, it's about making the world a better place. But are you on social media? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a Facebook page also. I think there's a link to that on, on my primary website. Okay, uh, great. But there's a lot of information on, on the greghammermd.com website. I will say just yeah, to address what, what you said about, uh, you know, the government and so on. The A in gain is acceptance. And I think that doesn't mean being lazy or just laissez-faire. What it means is discerning between what we can change and what we cannot change. And so, whereas you do see a lot of people who want uh, better international relations and so on, uh, you see them kind of talking about it all the time. And I think that goes to our negativity bias. Uh, we like talking about the problems in the world. Uh, that's okay up to a point. But, you know, it can be an obsession like our obsession with the past and the future. So I would go back to the A and gain, which is acceptance, discern what you can change and what you can't change. And that which you cannot change, accept it. So I think we have to accept the fact that the world is as it is. And there are elements that we definitely wish were otherwise. But uh, unless we feel that we could make a substantial change uh, we need simply to accept it. And to the extent we can make a change by embracing 
these principles that we've been discussing as individuals, let's do that. But then let's not dwell excessively on the things that we can't change that, that are negative in our lives. I agree. I, for a long time, I, I cut out all news. And then I realized, you know, I'm a global strategist. <laughs> so I, I sort of need to know what's going on. So I'm just very selective about what I do and, and how I'm using my voice. I, I believe I'm very consistent. I use my voice to try to make the world a better place. And um, not everyone appreciates some of the things I'm saying, and that's okay too. But I want to just say the name of the book again, because I highly recommend it. It's Gain Without Pain, the happiness handbook for healthcare professionals. But once again, this is for all of us, because we're sort of all helping each other during this. So this is for you know employers. I, I have a corporations company right now saying, we don't even know how to get all of our employees back to work, much less our employees with disabilities. And what do you think? And I, I say, well, first of all, your employees with disabilities are just your employees. But so that what you do for one group, you really should do for everybody. And take the time to, to, to focus on your happiness and be grateful and things like that. But I really do highly recommend Dr. Gregory Hammer's book. Um, also, as a reminder, his website, and we will post it with the, um, the interview, is www.gregoryhammermd.com. So highly recommend it. There's a lot of wonderful books out there, but I think he has a very important voice and one that we all need to listen to so that we can be a little bit happier. So Dr. Gregory Hammer, thank you so much for being on the show. We really Definitely, we really, really appreciate your work right now. All, well, I, I, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. It's by the way, it's GregHammerMD.com, just so people don't put oh, Gregory in there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So www.GregHammerMD.com, which is why I'm going to give you the link too, since I can't say it right. But thank you for correcting that. But thank you for your work, and you stay safe in California, and keep doing what you're doing because it's making a difference. We appreciate you. Likewise, and thank you very much. Thank you.